Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome you to this to this talk titled Ordering the Chaos, in which we'll discuss some things in microservices and in distributed world. My name is Adam Furmanek and I'll be your host for today. And greetings from Europe, because I'm actually in Europe right now. So it's some time around midnight here in my time zone. So I guess you may be sleepy a bit, but I'm as well. Um, let's move on. Uh, let's begin. Uh, before we actually move on to the topic of this presentation, a couple words about me. Um, I have like 10 years of professional software development experience, working on multiple things, including backend, front end machine learning, mobile applications, etc. etc. I'm also a blogger and public speaker, so feel free to draw, to take a look at my blog at blog.adamfurmanek.pl in where I describe a lot of things, mostly about internals of various platforms or some math thingies. Uh, I'm also an author of the .NET Internals Cookbook, uh, a book which you can buy at Amazon and which explains or covers plenty of internals of the .NET platform. Feel free to drop me a line or on email, Twitter, Slack channel, chat here, whatever works for you, uh, either during this talk or afterwards. Uh, yeah, so that would be it. Let's move on and let's see what is ahead of us for today. Uh, so what we are going to do is, well, well the, the main point of this talk or the, the main goal we would like to achieve is we would like to see how to order the events in the distributed systems uh, so we can uh, first clean the logs so they are more readable for us so we have a nice trace of what's going on and also because we would like to probably get some consensus around the, around all the nodes in the distributed system uh, we are working on. Uh, and the, the first thing which comes to mind when we think about ordering things is using timestamps. So that's the thing we would like to use. Uh, however, using time, using wall clock in distributed systems is not generally something we should be doing. Uh, and we'll learn why. Uh, so the agenda for this talk is first, we'll see what the time actually is. What does it mean that we have some time or whether we use some wall clock? And then we will see how the time is being used in the computer science or in the like software engineering in general. Uh, next, we'll understand why we should be avoiding it, why we should avoid using clock in the computer science or in any applications we write. And then we'll figure out how to fix that, how to use something instead of the wall clock to to do what we really want to do. So we will see some actual implementations on code slides and etc. And at the very end of this talk, we will just go beyond time. We will figure out how to generalize the solution to do something more. So we will start with cleaning the logs and ordering them. So the logs are readable for us from uh, in the system which we are using. But then we will see how the solution which we come up with may be, may be later extended to support more and more scenarios. Uh, so let's go, let's begin. So what is time? Uh, this seemingly trivial question obviously is uh, has a very sophisticated answer. Uh, but one thing we need to keep in mind is there is no one global time, especially when we are talking computers. Um, that's because every single machine, every single node in our system uh, has the, its own clock, its own time, its own way of measuring the, the elapsed time. Um, there is also a physical thing which we just cannot avoid, which is that the, there is a delay after we between reading the clock and actually using the value. So whenever we go to the clock, like the physical piece of our computer and ask it, hey, what's the time? And uh, there is some time which need to just pass by uh, until we can finally use the this value. It doesn't matter whether it's measured in like nanoseconds or milliseconds, uh, because for computers, it's always too long. For us humans, it's simple when the time is like measured down to a second or down to a minute. That's perfectly fine for us. We can probably deal with it. However, for computers, when our CPUs, they, they run with like gigahertz uh, frequency, like every single nanosecond is super important. So we just cannot uh, cope with the delay we have. We cannot accept it. We cannot afford it. Um, obviously, there are more things which we need to take in mind. For instance, the clocks, even assuming we could synchronize them, they will just drift apart like because of the special theory of relativity, right? Depending 
depending where the machine is, whether it's like somewhere uh, in the United States or somewhere in Australia, the clock will work differently than the, the clock on the International Space Station. Obviously, uh, all these things are physical, so they break over time. Like we may synchronize the clocks, but after some time they will just uh, drift apart, so they will show different uh, different measurements, and we just cannot deal with that. Obviously, there are more and more sophisticated clocks. We have atomic clocks, etc., but we just cannot beat the physics here. Uh, so, what is time? Well. The answer to that is currently the time, like one standard second, is defined as some periods of transition between uh, between cesium. Uh, however, for us, what is time for the purpose of this talk is we will just consider the time being like the wall clock measurement. So imagine there is a clock on your wall, which shows you there is something like 9.04 probably or 9.06 currently in Australia. So this is the time for us. Uh, and whenever we talk about time, uh, obviously there are things like time and time zone. So we probably know there is a UTC, Coordinated Universal Time, which is based on atomic clock and it's synchronized and broadcasted around the globe. Uh, we will get later to that how this thing is broadcasted, but it's worth keeping in mind that this thing is broadcasted with some accuracy which can be measured in microseconds. So for our CPUs, that's uh, way too slow. Uh, so we start with time. However, what is a time zone? We typically think about the time zone being a, a UTC offset. So we think there is like UTC plus 11 in Australia or UTC plus 2 in Central Europe. And we think this is a time zone. Uh, unfortunately, it's not true because time zone is not only the, the offset from the UTC plus 0 or just the UTC time, but it's also uh, it also con includes rules how the time changes. It includes rules for daylight saving time, and it includes rules that this, uh, this time zones or these offsets did change over time. They did change over years, for instance, in 20th century or in uh, older centuries as well. We typically also think that the time zone is UTC plus some integer, uh, like plus some number of hours, full number of hours. Unfortunately, it's not the case. There are time zones which can be like 30 minutes or 45 minutes after a full time. And also, obviously, these uh, they, will, they were mostly they are not uh, not uh, currently, but there were also some more sophisticated time zones, for instance, which were 24 minutes after a full after a full hour. When we are talking about DST, DST is also tricky because typically we think that it changes twice a year, sometime in March, sometimes in October, and the time is moved like from 2 a.m. at night to 3 a.m. and then moved back from 3 a.m. to 2 a.m. Unfortunately, depending on the country, it may be different. For instance, the time may be changed at midnight or five minutes after midnight, etc. So these things are not consistent around the globe. Um, and we can also answer uh, or we can also pose a question here uh, because we do have this DST and we would like to show a calendar to our users. Uh, how do we show an event which is happening like half a year from now? This is something which we typically don't think about, but imagine that you are just booking a plane ticket, which will be sometime in March or April uh, next year. And what's going on? How will you show it on calendar when the DST rules change over time? So we will be like in winter time or in summer time. And what should we should we put on the calendar? We'll get to that a little later. However, uh, I also mentioned to you that, that the time zones, they do change, uh, or sorry, the offsets, they do change. So you may be in one particular place uh, on this planet, and uh, it doesn't mean that the offset will be constant across the years. For instance, there is a very nice example of, of Warsaw time zone, where I come from, that like in, uh, in, 20, in 19th century, the offset was plus one hour and 24 minutes. So you ask for your local time, hey, what was local time 720 in some year, and you get 744. This is definitely not something we would be expecting, which only adds the complexity to the whole idea. Uh, just closing on this time zone and DST uh, changes, a couple things that uh, first, 
there are plenty of different uh, different uh, offsets around the planet, plenty of different time zones. And typically we think that, well, the bigger the country is, the more time zones it has. And while it is true, for instance, for United States or Australia, there are multiple time zones over there, it's different, for instance, in China. China runs on one single time zone across the whole, the whole country. It's also interesting, for instance, in Russia. In Russia, there are multiple time zones. However, once you enter the train station, you are always running on one single particular time zone because all the trains in Russia, they use just one time zone to make uh, make this a little simpler. So time zones are tricky. And DST uh, daylight saving time is also tricky because we typically think, hey, there is just DST time, right? It changes twice a year. However, it depends on the country. There are countries which do not have DST time. There are countries which did have DST. Now they don't have DST. Uh, and it also differs even within one country. For instance, in the United States, and uh, most of the states, they do have the DST time, uh, unless you are in Arizona. Arizona does not observe the DST time zone, unless you are a Navajo tribe in Arizona, because they do observe the DST. So it's not like the time zone here is not something as an offset from the UTC. It also depends where you live, but it also depends who you are. Because if you are in some tribe, you may observe the DST unless uh, like differently than the rest of the state. So it is it is tricky. And just closing this topic, we typically think that UTC and GMT they are the same thing. Um, it's not true, not entirely true, because UTC is a time which is based on an atomic clock. Uh, so it's supposed to be based on some physical clock, which is related to the cesium uh, transitions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, however, GMT is a time which is based on a rotation of the Earth, and GMT is actually a time zone. Uh, so UTC is supposed to be synchronized with GMT, and it's supposed to be an approximation of GMT, because it's because it's an approximation, it may be different. Uh, so the, the biggest difference which is allowed is 0.9 seconds. So UTC and GMT, they, can, they may differ up to 0.9 seconds. And also because we need to synchronize them somehow, UTC is synchronized using the leap seconds. You probably heard about that. Sometimes there is a leap second introduced, leap second, which is additional second in given minutes. So given minute does not have 60 seconds, but 61 of them. Uh, however, according to standard, a leap second may also be removed. So we may also have a minute, which is 50 nine seconds, not 60 seconds. Uh, but this is this only makes it uh, even more complicated. And leap second can is also a super tricky because it can actually break our computers. Like this happened multiple times. One of the more known uh, issue which, uh, which occurred because of the leap second was something which happened in 2012 when plenty of Linux systems and especially MySQL databases, they started consuming like 100% CPU. They spiked like crazy just because a leap second was introduced. Uh, at that time, leap second was mostly added just like an additional second. So we really had a minute which had 61 seconds. And this obviously, this broke the, the task scheduler in the Linux operating system. So then it, it caused some more issues. Currently, this bug is gone. And we also, instead of doing the, of adding the, the actual one second to the minute, what we do is we do the time smearing. So we just make these 60 seconds in a minute still being 60 seconds, but they just last a little longer. So this, we smear this additional second over a prolonged period of time to, to avoid issues like this. Uh, but okay, let's say we would like to use the time in distributed systems. So, and we would like to use all these time zones and all these things we have here. The question is, how do we know what the time zone is or how these DST change uh, around the globe? Um, so the thing is, there is a database which is called TZ database or time zone info or time zone database, which is distributed by IANA, which includes all the things about the, the time zones. They are typically released multiple times a year and they are uh, identified by a year number and a letter. And there is obviously an RFC which explains how this database is distributed, how it's updated, etc., etc. So whenever you have, for instance, a Linux machine and you do something like sudo apt-get to to, to install updates, the TZ data package 
is just updated as a regular uh, a regular package in your operating system. And this is how you update the DST, uh, DST uh, information. Obviously, because we have multiple operating systems, it wouldn't be that simple to just have one database. There is another database, which is called CLDR, Common Local Data Repository, uh, which includes not only the time zone info, but also the the locales. So whenever you have NUS or NGB uh, or NAU languages or locales, they are stored in this CLDR uh, database. And Microsoft and Apple uh, and a couple other companies, they do use CLDR over the TZ info. So again, we do have multiple solutions. And what's worse, CLDR and TZ info are not consistent, meaning that uh, they do are not released on the same schedule. So it may be that one operating system already includes the changes for time zone info, other operating system does not, which makes it even more uh, even more crazy. Um, that would be it, like the introduction about time. So now comes the question. Let's say we would like to use the time anyway. We would like to just use the timestamps to order events or to clean up logs or do whatever we would like to do. The question is, how, which, what time should we use? Should we use local time or UTC time? And obviously, whenever you go to, to Stack Overflow or just Google these things, uh, everyone tells you, hey, just use UTC. It solves all the issues. Unfortunately, it's not true uh, because UTC does not know about DST changes and doesn't know about the time zones uh, in general. Uh, and currently, this is actually something which is happening right now in European Union. European Union wants to, to drop the DST changes, and each country will be allowed to decide whether they want to stay on summertime, want to stay on winter time, or whether they just want to use DST still. Uh, so let's see how this can break our existing applications using this simple example. Let's say that we would like to organize some event at, on, at 10 a.m. on September in 2022, right? So almost two years from now in Amsterdam. Currently, the expected time zone as the, let's say, time zone as the UTC offset in Amsterdam is supposed to be UTC plus two. However, we don't know what's going to happen with Amsterdam of, or with the Netherlands in general, uh, like over years. They may decide that they will stay on summertime or winter time, so they may be at UTC plus one on the September 4th, 2022, but we don't know that yet. So how should we store the time now to be sure that this does not break over time? So. Obviously, let's store this as UTC. That's what Stack Overflow tells you. And this is what we typically do in our applications because we do have this date time uh, type in C Sharp language. We do have some Gregorian calendar or other date uh, types in SQL, Java, whatever languages. So we just store this time, put it in database, and we think we are good. So let's see what's going to happen. Uh, so we take the event time and we would like to store it in UTC, right? So the event time is 9 a.m. We recalculate it to be in UTC time zone. So it will be 7 a.m. after calculations. And then what's going to happen is Amsterdam decides they will drop the DST changes. So on September 4th, 2022, they will be in UTC plus one. So what's going to happen like two years from now when we when we see what the time is for the, the event start, we'll just extract the value from the database and calculate as we will add one hour because, hey, Amsterdam is in UTC plus one. So we'll get 8 a.m. Uh, so we actually missed the time. We are one hour ahead of the event. So pros of this solution, well, it's easy to implement and cons, it just doesn't work. And if you ever store time in your application, you actually may hit issues like this. This is something I already mentioned. Imagine that you are booking a plane ticket two years from now. Uh, and if you just store the time in UTC, it may be that two years from now, you may be either slightly unlucky that you arrive at the airport an hour earlier than you should be or than you would like to be, or you may be super unlucky because you arrive one hour too late and you just miss the flight. Uh, okay, so how to do it better? Well, we could store the time as UTC and keep updating it. And this is what we 
probably should do. So we need to store the time as UTC. So it is going to be 7 a.m. But we also include TZ or CLDR databases updates to recalculate the time. So whenever we get a TZ update and we see that Amsterdam changed their time zone and they will be in UTC plus one uh, in September 2022, we just go to database and update the value which we stored there from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, pros, well, this works and this is a huge advantage of this solution. Cons, well, we need to store the TZ info in the database. We need to access historical data. We need to be able to tell like logically what happened with this time, uh, like whether the time zone changed from plus two to plus one or the opposite or the other way, or maybe there were no changes at all. But if we want to be sure that we do not break things over years, this is what we actually should do. But there are also other solutions. And for instance, one not necessarily obvious solution is just to store the event that it starts at 9 a.m. using some completely non-typed value, like a string. Hey, the event is 9 a.m. Because this is what our customers give us. They come to us and tell us, hey, the event starts at 9 a.m. and this is what we should store in the database. Uh, obviously, we would like to use some well strongly typed daytime or, or whatever else, but generally the ground truth for us is that the event starts at 9 a.m. Uh, so this is yet another solution and it works nice. Uh, however, the, the problem with this or the, the challenge would be that we need to again keep some data which we are not necessarily used to because we would like to use this date time type which is there. Uh, so I'm not telling you that UTC, uh, that we should drop UTC and go with local time or something like this. UTC probably is still our best bet. However, just keep in mind that keeping only the time part in UTC may not be enough. We need to keep the UTC time with date and also with the time zone database info so we know how these things can change over time. And there are so many other problems with time. Uh, you may heard about this very popular article once upon a time, uh, like uh, false good programmers believe about time. So all the things you can see here in the slide that are all false, meaning that minute does not has does not have 60 seconds, that year does not have 365 days, that February does not have 28 days, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I encourage you to take a look at this link because it covers so many interesting things we would never consider. Uh, but let's just quickly walk through a couple of them. Uh, so month begins and ends in the same year. This is not necessarily true because, uh, well, we typically think that the new year is on January 1st, right? But it wasn't the case in uh, in uh, like older centuries. Uh, most of the like most of the countries they adopted the the new year starting on January first, like something in 16th century. However, when it comes to adoption of Gregorian calendar, the calendar which we typically use, for instance, Russia was pretty late to do so. Uh, so these things they do change. Hopefully, we don't need to deal with them currently. But it's worth keeping in mind that it was different, uh, different uh, in the past. February has 28 days. We obviously know there is February. The February may have 29 days when we have the the, the leap year, which happens every four years, uh, as long as it's not every like 100 years, as long as it is not every 400 years or something like this. We know the rules, right? And only in Sweden in 1712, February had 30 days in the Gregorian calendar. Uh, why was it so? That's because instead when all the countries in Europe, because they adopted Gregorian calendar, they skipped 11 days. Uh, the Sw Sweden decided not to do so. What they did instead, they thought, well, we'll be just skipping the leap February 29th. Uh, but then war started, uh, so they forgot to do it or they do it one, uh, one once too many. So then they had to, you know, roll back this basically by introducing February 30th. So this is what happens. Not to mention that there are so many other calendars. For instance, there is some weird calendar symmetry for 5-4, which has 35 days in February, but hopefully we don't need to deal with them. 
at least not today. Uh, the last thing, which is a minute last 60 seconds or something like this, and definitely not an hour. Uh, and this is again a bug in, in our application or in the computer uh, because there was this bug in KVM on CentOS. So whenever you paused a virtual machine, it was not updating its clock when you resumed it. So the clock was really going away, showing that, hey, your minute could physically last for hours and your clock wasn't aware of that. Uh, so this makes using clock much, much harder in computer systems than we typically think uh, it is. But let's say that we would like to use it because, hey, we all have the wall clock. We all have like in bottom right corner or in, in top right corner, we do have the clock, right? So how does it work if it's so hard to do it right? Uh, and basically the algorithm to synchronize clocks between machines is the simplest one we could e even ever imagine. It's based on the super simple principle. We just go to the other system and we ask, hey, what's the time? And we wait for the answer. We can communicate over internet, we can communicate over network, we can communicate over wire or wireless, but that's it. We just go ask, hey, what's the time? Give me your time. Uh, so then uh, we obviously will have some uh, some reading which is not precise because it's delayed because of the network, because it's delayed because of the physical mechanism reading the time. Uh, so we cannot rely on it. So what we do instead is we just repeat this question many times. So when we ask this question like 100 times, we can more or less, and we average the results, we can more or less say, okay, that should be the time. So this is the simplest algorithm. And this is actually algorithm which is being used. And there is a protocol called NTP, Network Time Protocol, which works on this principle. Uh, so whenever we do have these atomic clocks, uh, the whole world is like a split divided into multiple stratas, multiple layers, depending how far a given machine is from the atomic clock. So stratum zero is the layer of atomic clocks. And then these clocks, the, the readings, they are broadcasted to stratum one, to the next layer. Uh, so they are synchronized within a few microseconds. And then we have another layer, layer two, which is synchronized to layer one. So you can see that the further you are from the atomic clock, your reading will be more imprecise. However, this is what we what we just do. And also your operating system takes care of that. So for instance, your Windows or Linux machine, it knows where the NTP server is and it periodically goes and asks for the for the time to synchronize your clock. NTP uses slightly more sophisticated algorithm because it essentially does the same, goes to some machine, asks, hey, what's the time? But it also tries to, to approximate what the network latency could be, what the round trip delay is, et cetera, et cetera. So then it gathers some data and estimates the, the actual time. But generally, this is based on the same principle. There are also a couple other approaches which are based not necessarily on different uh, principle, how we get the time, but they try to broadcast this time more efficiently. So do it faster, so with lower delay, etc., etc. One interesting algorithm here is the true time used by Google. Uh, the Google true time database guarantees that your clock will differ by up to seven milliseconds uh, from other nodes. So if you know what your upper bound for the delay is, you can just use the timestamps because if in worst case, you just need to wait for seven milliseconds before, for instance, committing the transaction. So that's the idea to, to do it. Uh, however, this is in order to do it, you need to have atomic clocks, you need to have backup uh, network connections, etc., etc. So it's not something we can easily use in, in all our systems. So what do we do? Well, we need to avoid clock, but we need to build something different. So we need to build our custom clock something we can use with distributed systems. So we will be building a logical clock, which will be capable of answering whether event A happened before event B. And we would like to do it on multiple machines over the internet, meaning one server is in Sydney, Australia, the other server is in like New York, United States, yet another server is somewhere in Tokyo, Japan, right? Uh, so this is our goal. We would like to synchronize all these machines around the globe. 
Uh, we want it to be fast. We don't want to wait for milliseconds. We want to be it to be as fast as possible. And important restriction here, we are interested only in one given particular flow, workflow, transaction, job execution, you name it. So we won't be comparing all the events in our system. We are only interested in, for instance, one scenario when the user comes, he clicks like to buy a, a product and all the transactions happening because we clicked in the cart, I would like to purchase this thingy. All these things we want to synchronize, all of these things we want to order, but we are not interested in comparing two different users buying from two different cards at the same time. So what can we do? Uh, we can use a thing which is called a Lamport timestamp or Lamport happened before relationship. So this thing tells us whether event A influenced event B, and this is also denoted using this, uh, this nice uh, arrow syntax. So, so we say that event A was happened before event B or event A influenced event B. And this provides us the partial ordering because once we know which events influenced which, uh, which others, we can easily order them and we can say what was the, the order of these events in the system. The algorithm is that we'll be synchronizing clocks and here is like a formal specification of algorithm, but instead of going through this, let's see an example. So what we are going to do is we are, let's say that we do have three machines like machine one, two, and three. And for each of them, each of these machines, they have a, a clock, basically a logical clock. So let's say that machine one has a clock which goes like uh, with six seconds every tick. So this is second zero, second six, et cetera, et cetera. Second machine goes with resolution of eight seconds, so eight, 16, 24. And the third machine goes with resolution of 10 seconds. Okay, so what is going to happen now is the idea is that once we are as long as we are on one single machine and we do not talk to each other all the events they influence the next one in line so they influence the next line of code so this event zero influences the event at time six this event here influences yet another event and so on and so on right so basically we assume like we can say that we are just executing on one single thread we ignore the cpu reordering we ignore the parallelism etc but once we start talking between machines, what happens is we say that one event is influencing the other event because of the communication. So the arrow here, like arrows A, B, C, and D, they represent the communication between machines, which, for instance, can be interpreted as, let's say, HTTP call, right? Or REST request or whatever else, just a network call between two nodes. So what happens if we just go with the ordinary, like regular solution without using Lamport at all? So we can see that there was a message sent at time six, which was received at time 16. So far, so good. The same here, something set at time 24 and then received at time 40, which is okay. The problem arises when we start going back. So we send a message at time 60, which is received at time 56. So it's received in the past. So if we are using a like regular timestamps, this is the issue which will occur. There will be message which was sent after it was received. However, once we uh, we start using Lamport timestamps, the idea is pretty simple. We take a maximum of two clocks and we send the clock with each message. So for these two messages, A and B, nothing changes. We send a message at time six, receive at time 16. We send a message B at time 24, receive at time 40. However, here what changes is that when we send this message C, we not only send the, the content of the message, but we also send the clock with the message. So here, the machine here realizes that it should be time 54, but then it compares its own clock with the one received from the other machine. So it compares 54 with 60, it takes the maximum of these two values and increments them. So we get 61 because we took a maximum of 60, 54 and 60 and added one. Same, and then you can see that we 
update our clock so the next tick is not at like a 54 plus 8 so 62 but the next tick is at 61 plus 8. The same goes for another communication we send a message at 69 so we would be receiving it something around probably 54 or something like this we take a maximum of these two clocks add one and we end with 70. So that's the idea and uh, why is it useful for us? Why is it helpful at all? It is helpful because once we know that event A influenced event, event B, then we know that clock of event A is less than clock of event B. And it works only for the events which influence each other, where, where they are one is influenced by the other. So in single threaded scenario, all the just as, as I said, like we can imagine that one line of code influences the next line of code. However, for two separate machines, the events influence each other's only when they communicate. So going back here, we can say that this event influenced this one and this event influenced this one. We can also say that all these events here influenced all these events here because these events here on the left they were before the communication happened however we cannot tell anything about events here and events here because these events here on the left they happened after the communication here after this point here so we don't know whether these two whether these events actually happened physically before this so we cannot tell anything about that because in order to event influence an event on the other machine, there needs to be a communication in between. So that's the idea. Uh, and how do we implement it? Like in real life, like uh, in the source code. Um, so it might sound tricky, but actually is not that uh, sophisticated. What we need to do is uh, in order to clean up the logs, because this is the problem which we are solving right now, what we want to generate is we would like to have this nice lamp or timestamps to order events. And we would also like to have uh, some logical ID of the flow we are talking about what this ID would be. Imagine that we are talking about like buying, uh, purchasing something uh, in the e-commerce platform. So once the user hits a button to buy something, we generate an ID which represents all the things which need to happen to, to, to correlate all the events to fulfill this one purchase. So we can imagine this could be something like update the database, calculate the price, send the confirmation email, send the, the message to, to the delivery team that something needs to be actually physically delivered to the user. Uh, so this is what we call a correlation ID. And it's important for us for this correlation ID to be unique through the whole workflow. And then how can we use it? Well, if something goes wrong and for instance, the process failed when purchasing something, we can show to our user a message saying, hey, we screwed up, something went wrong, yada, yada. If you want to reach out to us, please give us this ID. And you show the user some string, which they are supposed to just copy and include in the email. So then we can find all the messages, all the logs in given workflow, just by using the correlation ID, and then we can order them, sort them by using the logical time. So the correlation ID is maintained across all the nodes involved in fulfilling the request. It's never modified and it must be unique. So typically it would be something like GUID new GUID. For logical time, this is something which we will be modifying and this is something where we will implement the Lamport timestamp. So we start with an interface like this iCorrelator, which supports or which provides these things like the correlation ID, the, the logical time, and also has this method to update the time, which we will be using to, to update the time when we receive it from some other interested party. We may also include other things like, for instance, string activity, which is like a human readable or friendly user-friendly name of what's going on. And then we start with a base implementation of this correlator, which is going to be reused across all the nodes. And it's important here that this implementation works logically or, or is equivalent, no matter what language, what technology we use. So the implementation is pretty, pretty 
obvious once we understand the Lamport timestamp. So for logical time, what we do is, or first, we do have the, the logical time field, which is basically an integer, right? Because our clock is just an integer. It could be long depending how, uh, how many ticks you expect. And when we want to get the time, what we do is we just increment it. Obviously, here I just use interlocked increment for the sake of performance, so we do not, uh, do not lock things uh, here, but it's just the idea is that we increment this time and return it. And for updating the time, what we do is we compare the, the current time with the new time received from the other party. So we calculate the maximum of these two times, and then we try to like use interlock to store that in the field. Obviously, we could just lock it if, if we want to lock it. But the idea is that we take these two times and we store them in the field. So this is the correlator, which is a base class or the common logic for all the correlators which we'll be using across throughout the system. And then we come to the logger interface, which is basically used to log things here. So you can see that logger is has this iCorrelator instance and has some, mess, some method to log the message. And the way we probably want to log the message includes plenty of things which we would like to log along the message, not only the message content, but also other things. So for instance, the, mess, the things, the, the components I typically log, uh, which are more or less useful in every single system, are timestamp, like human readable time, 920 in Sydney time zone, whatever. Application name, because we have multiple applications like database, web server, load balancer, whatever else. Instance ID, this is an instance of the machine, right? When we have a big fleet, we have multiple machines. This is the instance. A current thread, current process ID, whatever. If we do have a memory dump of a process, it's useful to have a thread ID. So we can later, for instance, check the stack traces if needed. Correlation ID crucial part. So this is the identifier of the workflow we are currently working on. Obviously level, obviously some activity name if we have it, uh, and the logical time. So the lamp or timestamp. I also include logger ID because I typically have multiple loggers. Obviously, this is not like a extensive list of all the things you should be logging. Depends on your use case. You also need to keep in mind that the more you log, the longer string you need to create. So the more memory you use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you need to balance it out, right? You want to log as much as possible so it's easy for you to figure out uh, from logs what was happening. But at the same time, you don't want to like spend plenty of time on logging because logging can kill the distributed system or the system with uh, which is supposed to be to be fast. So we have this logger, and how does it work now? Uh, so imagine that our user comes and he hits or she hits a button to purchase something. So the first thing we hit or the network request hits is probably like the load balancer. Uh, so what we need to do in this load balancer, we need to generate the correlation ID and start measuring the time. So we do have some correlator again, which basically creates the, the correlation ID, like GUID new GUID, and we do have some, uh, some correlation ID method to, to get it, and we do have some activity. Simple as that. This is what we do when entering the bounded context of given workflow. What happens next is imagine that the web server, load balancer, whatever, wants to communicate with something else, like database or like some other node. What we need to do is we need to pass this, uh, that correlation ID and that logical time. And what we can, for instance, do is we can implement a REST client, which would be including these two things with headers. Right, So we add two additional headers to the network call, like correlation ID header and correlation counter, logical time, time stamp, whatever else. And we just get these two things from the correlator, which we, which we already saw, the base implementation of correlator, which incre increments the time, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we do on the side which initiates the communication. Now what we need to do is on the other side of the communication, we need to basically parse these headers and update 
our local correlation ID and our local time. So what we do is, for instance, depending what net, what framework you use, what uh, like library for network calls, etc. What you do is, for instance, you can just get this from HTTP context or activity in your uh, activity constructor in your action filter in in whatever else, right? Just at the entrance when you enter the the uh, start parsing or receiving the network call, you need to exit these two these two headers and and update both logical time here and also the, the correlation ID then because you are processing things locally you just keep the logical time updated in memory as always what happens next is we probably finished the network call so we would like to return the response so we need to do is in the response um, we need to uh, we need to basically send the same uh, the same headers as a response. So what we do is again in your activity framework action etc cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, you can just add these two uh, two headers back. You probably don't need to return the correlation ID. However, it's probably not a big deal to add it, but you need to include the logical time so it can be updated on the other side. There was a question on the chat. On the, chat. Uh, the question is, did you see Jimmy Bogart's talk yesterday on distributed tracing and .NET Core built in support for W3 standard trace context, which uses cross-platform standard headers? Uh, I haven't seen it, and I'm actually surprised that finally there is a, a cross-platform standard header for uh, for things like this. Uh, because when I was first uh, giving this talk, there were no things like this, and I was actually asking this question: Hey, is there a framework which would be doing this uniformly? Uh, it's very good that finally this thing is standardized, because hopefully one day we won't need to implement this lamp or timestamp at all. Uh, to, to do this. But yes, uh, typically what uh, what frameworks did or what people did, you can always create your own header like x dash something, which is basically an extension, but hopefully it gets standardized one day so it will be uniform across all the all the services. Moving on. So what we did is we returned the response. So now what happens is on the sender, on the initiator of the communication, we need to basically parse the response and update our logical clock. So just the same way like previously we had these headers when sending the request. Right now what we do is we parse the response, we extract the headers, and we update the logical time. So this is the, the concept which is seemingly very simple and in fact it is simple what is hard in implementing this concept correctly is we need to make sure that we pass this lamp or timestamp and the correlation id across all the nodes and we do it uniformly it it means that we need to pass it via network calls via queue messages via database transactions via any framework we have so just as someone mentioned on the chat there is now http header for doing that it's http header that's cool, but also we have other things which are not necessarily network calls. For instance, when you post a message to your service bus or to your queue, you also need to include the logical time in the queue as well, probably using like metadata for the message. Whether you wire it through dependency injection or the middleware, it's not required, but it's super useful to have it clear and, and like uh, contained in one, uh, one place. And whether you put your logger on top of existing logging library or below, that doesn't matter necessarily. What you basically need to do is you somehow need to pass these things to the logging framework so they are locked. And what we do next? Well, when we have all these things tied together, the ultimate big win which we have right now is when user comes to your service or help desk and tells you, hey, something went wrong and they give you this correlation ID, you can just get grab all the logs you have across all the machines you do have, no matter whether they are in Tokyo, in Sydney, in New York, or London, doesn't matter. You get all the messages for given correlation ID, and you can order them using the Lamport timestamp. And as long as you know which events influenced which, so you know how your application works more or less, you can reason about what was happening in which order in the application. That's it.
that's it for the order for cleaning logs. And now we can focus a little more on the ordering the events in the in the system. And for that, we will basically only touch the topic uh, because it is pretty big research thingy and it's much uh, more complex than what we want to cover for today. So this is more of giving you idea how we can reuse this uh, even more. So uh, we started with one clock, which was used in all the nodes. We can also build something which is a vector clock, uh, which would be basically a list of clocks for every single node we have in our system. So to show you an example how this differs, previously when we did have a clock and we did have communication, all these nodes, they had like one logical clock which was passed with the message. And then at this point, when we were receiving the message, we were comparing these two clocks and calculating the maximum of that. With vector clock, what we do now is we store all the received clocks and we keep them in memory. So we remember that node B at this point had some clock local clock B and also had some clock C, which was received from node C. And once we build all these clocks, you can see that ultimately like every single node will have clocks for every other node. What we can do next, having this vector clock instead of a Lapper clock, we can start comparing these vectors. And comparison here is basically just like we would be comparing the, the values uh, using regular vector comparison. So vector is less than the other vector if they are equal on each component and there is next some component which is strictly less than. The big win here we have is that as with Lamport clock, when A influences B, event A influences B, we know that vector clock of A is less than vector clock of B. But unlike with Lamport, we also know that if vector clock of A is less than vector clock of B, then A happened before B. This is something we did not have with Lamport timestamps. This is something we do have with vector clocks. Uh, there is yet another question or comment in the chat does not specifically include time, but can, you can add a trace state header with custom key value pairs. Standard says systems that don't understand must pass through. Yep. So, so this is yet a, about this, this new headers, which are now standardized in RFC that if some system does not understand the timestamp that's passed through, uh, so it's not lost, which is actually pretty, pretty useful. So, so yeah, if this is a, this becomes a, a common thing across the distributed systems or across the frameworks, it's going to probably can be used for the things we are now talking about. So it's cool. It's finally standardized. Um, Going back to vector clocks, so the big win, the, the advantage we have here is if we can compare clocks, we also can tell something about events which we didn't have with Lamport timestamps. And how can we use it later? So the thing is, uh, and there are obviously a couple more generalizations of these clocks, we'll skip that for now. And how can we use it? We can use it to solve a problem which in the literature is called a Byzantine generals problem. When we do have a, a distributed system, the trick here is that uh, nodes can fail. So imagine that we do have like an army and they want to make a decision where they didn't want to attack or retreat. And there is a general which makes a decision we attack. General passes this decision to all the lieutenants. However, there is one malicious lieutenant here, which instead of passing the right decision, so the decision which general made, he passes the, the, the other decision to retreat here. So this thing happens in distributed systems often when machine crashes and they crash a lot. Uh, machines, they do crash a lot. So they may work incorrectly in some way, send invalid messages, send messages out of order, invalid according to RFC, whatever else. What can we do about that? Uh, when anything of this happens, like the protocol is violated, message is repeated, messages are broken, etc., we are talking that we would like to have a system which is k-fold tolerant. So we would like to build a system which can survive at most k failures. So at most k nodes, if they crash, we are still okay. If more components fail, then we break. So if we do not have Byzantine failures, so if our nodes, they do behave like decently, 
then we need only k plus one components to be k fault tolerant. Why? Because we can just ask every component, and if at least one of them is working properly, we'll just get the answer. However, if they are Byzantine failures, meaning that the nodes may lie when it comes to answering the question, we need at least two k plus one components to be k fault tolerant, because we need to get answers from all the components and do the majority voting to find which answer is the most common. And this will be the answer. But this is only for reading. However, if we would like to start writing something, we need to basically solve a consensus problem, a problem which any, in which any node can fail, and we would like to have a mechanism which terminates at some point, so which finishes, which maintains the integrity, so when we are writing a value, this value which was proposed by at least one of the nodes is actually written, and also all the nodes, they agree which value is written. So this is the consensus problem we are trying to solve. And if we want to have k-fold a tolerant system, we actually need to have 3k plus plus one nodes to, to do so. And this is a much bigger research uh, because we can, there are circumstances in which we won't be able to achieve this or solve this consensus problem, that depends on the communication which we have, whether it's synchronous, asynchronous, ordered, unordered, with bounded delay or whatever else. And there are mathematical proofs that we cannot solve the consens consensus problem in some of these situations. But let's say that we can solve this consensus problem, how we would tackle it. There are multiple algorithms. One of them is, for instance, the, the raft algorithm, which also looks seemingly very simple because, well, we do have some leader node and other nodes are followers. And if leader crashes, the followers, they start the election process. So every follower says, hey, I want to be a leader. And they somehow come to an agreement how to do it. However, there is a mathematical challenge in this because it's very hard to actually prove that this algorithm will work under all circumstances in all edge cases and will never fail. So that's why devising, inventing these algorithms is pretty tricky and we should probably not be doing by ourselves. However, once we do have a solution like this, what we can do is we can implement a couple operations, one of them being total ordered broadcast. So this is an operation which basically uh, we can use it to have all the nodes in our system, no matter whether it's like system in one data center or whether it's globally around the globe, all the nodes will agree on some value, for instance, on the timestamp or on the order of messages which we would like to store. However, this is tricky. This is much uh, harder to implement correctly. This introduces long delays. It's so generally, if you are interested in how things can break with this approach, I encourage you to take a look at the Jepson framework, uh, which is basically a, a, a way to validate mathematically that the system works properly as expected and meets all the all the guarantees it's supposed to be providing, like transaction consistency or visibility or other things. Um, but once we do have it, we, once we have it, we can actually order the events the way we would like to to do. Wrapping up. Using world clocking distributed systems is not a way to go. Uh, you have seen that it's hard to synchronize clocks. Clocks are tricky. Clocks are very hard to, it's hard to reason about clocks as well, because this is not something we typically think about. But once we run globally, we need to do it. And it won't become any easier because, hey, we are running distributed systems now and the world won't uh, be simpler than it's now. It actually will be more complex. However, Lamport timestamp is a nice solution uh, for, for the... Uh, for ordering the logs and having some sanity. And if we want to have something more, then there are also other solutions which are more sophisticated, more complex, but they also start with this Lamport timestamp, uh, Lamport timestamp approach, which we have seen. q and I don't see any more questions here and I don't see any more questions on Slack. So that would be it. Feel free to drop me questions on Slack so we can answer them later. Couple more sources for you. If you would like to read more, 
about these things, I encourage you to take a look at these books, especially the Distributed Systems Principles and Paradigms by Tannenbaum. Pretty nice one uh, explaining most of the uh, concepts of distributed systems. And if you are actually writing something, there is, uh, or actually you want to build something which is super, uh, super scalable, I encourage you to read the designing data intensive applications. A pretty nice one. There is a question in the chat. I understood Lamport's logical time to be as simple as an incrementic integer. Yes. The answer is yes. This is basically incrementing an integer, which is simple. What is hard is propagating this integer across all the systems you have. Uh, because uh, because uh, once you go with heterogeneous environment and you have database, queue, service bus, file storage, whatever else, it's not as simple to propagate these timestamps uh, correctly or these Lamport timestamps. Uh, it's very easy to lose them. So there is there need to be some discipline how you implement these things. Uh, but generally, yes, it's just incrementing an integer. Uh, this is for books. Uh, if you would like to read something on the internet, couple things here, couple links. I also encourage you to take a look at my blog. There you can find basically the source code for the things I presented for you today. And you can read a little more uh, about what I told you. And this is the QR code pointing to the, to the slide deck. You can also Google my blog, blog Adam for Manic PL, and you'll find the talk over there with materials, with everything else. And having said all of that, uh, that's it for this morning. So my name is Adam Furmanek. Thank you for attending this talk. Hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of your day and the NDC conference. Thank you.